Shall we start? It's 1102. Good morning, one and all. I hope you all are safe and in good health. On behalf of the Center for Intellectual Property Rights at Institute of Law Nirma University, I welcome you all today to the panel discussion on relevance of intellectual property protection for fashion industry. We have with us the luminaries in the field of intellectual property rights who will provide us with insights into this relevant aspect. Today at the panel, we have Ms. Irene Kalboli, Professor of Law at Texas A&M University School of Law, Ms. Nabrata Pava, Advocate at the Delhi High Court, and Ms. Shreya Ganguly, Managing Associate at Fidesz Law Chambers. Our first panelist, Ms. Irene Kalboli, specializes in intellectual property, international trade, fashion, and cultural heritage law. Ma'am has authored several books, such as Intellectual Property Right, a comparative law and policy analysis for the Cambridge University Press. And she is also a member of the editorial board of various journals. Ma'am regularly acts as an expert for national governments and international organizations as well. She also conducts missions for the World Intellectual Property Organization, the EU Intellectual Property Office, and Commission and National IP Offices. We welcome you, Ma'am. Thank you for gracing the panel. Our next panelist, Ms. Namrita Pawa, pursued her master's from the National University of Singapore. In 2016, Ma'am started her independent practice and she holds expertise in the fields of intellectual property, fashion law, media broadcasting, civil dispute resolution, and advisory. Uh, Ma'am has also regularly writes on several legal aspects, including fashion law and intellectual property, and has, and has addressed the topic various times on both national and international platforms. We welcome you, ma'am. We are pleased to have you with us today. Our next panelist, Ms. Shreya Ganguly, is a managing associate at Fitness Law Chambers in the trademark and copyright team. Her practice area involves trademark searches and clearance, assignment and related transactions, prosecution and opposition, with design filing, Ma'am is a member of the Non-Traditional Trademarks Committee of the International Trademark Association, and she also conducts IP awareness classes for school students on behalf of the CEL for IPR promotion and management, the Government of India. We welcome you, Ma'am, today, and we are glad to have you with us. The session today will be moderated by Assistant Professor Ms. Kunjin Arora, Center Head. Ma'am, I request you to kindly take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amishi, and uh, thank you to all the panel members, uh, Ms. Irene, uh, Namrata Pahava, ma'am, and uh, Shreya, ma'am, for being here with us today, and uh, for uh, agreeing uh, to our invitation and, uh, like, you know, being here for the session. Uh, so, without uh, waiting for, uh, uh, like, you know, any more time, I think we should just start with the session right here. We have uh, the best, uh, uh, like, you know, from the field, uh, IP and uh, fashion law. And uh, fashion uh, and IP, you know, the interface that is there, I personally am uh, very interested to, uh, like, you know, understand the uh, various uh, concepts that are there and the aspects that govern, uh, like, you know, the rights of the um, uh, designers as far as the fashion industry is concerned and the relevance of uh, copyright. We've seen that there is a lot of, uh, like, you know, uh, controversies that come up with regard to whether the protection should be there under the copyright regime or should be, it should be there under the designs or whether, uh, like, you know, there should be a, a, a sui generis uh, provision. And uh, as far as India is concerned, we see that, uh, like, you know, there are a lot of uh, first copy uh, products that are uh, being, uh, like, you know, manufactured which are there in the market. And uh, these are what, uh, like, you know, the fashion, uh, uh, the people in the fashion industry, they create. And that, like, you know, directly comes to the market. So uh, I think uh, today we have uh, Professor Irene, uh, Ms. Namruta and Ms. Shreya to uh, discuss uh, with all of us on the nuances of uh, 
uh, like you know the interface between IP and uh, fashion law. So without wasting much time, I would now request Professor Irene uh, to please uh, start with the, her uh, discussion and uh, her insights on uh, the relevance of uh, IP to fashion industry. Yeah, thank you again. I hope I can, I'm audible. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. Excellent. So I decided um, since uh, we have been asked to speak for around 10 minutes uh, because we're going to have you know rounds of presentations and then comments and questions and, and, and more rounds. I'm not going to use slides for once. Um, because I think it will be um, a bit, um, you know, losing the perspective in, in such a short time. Um, so you are, um, you know, the panel wants to discuss the intellectual property and fashion intersection. Um, I teach fashion law and of course, you know, I teach uh, intellectual property and I research on in intellectual property. And I am uh, very interested in uh, the various aspects of IP and law that apply to the fashion industry. And I've been working closely with the fashion and luxury industry. And so these are the few things I am happy, um, you know, I can, I can share. Um, first of all, um, I think the protection of intellectual property and fashion still considerably varies across the world. Um, IP is very harmonized in general, but fashion is one of the areas in which there is a bit less harmonization. And this is vastly because there is the interest of the big players in the IP ecosystem don't fully align at least yet. Um, uh, the big intensive fashion industries are in terms of creativity are mostly Italian, French, in terms of national industries. Um, there is a lot of productions of textiles across the world, Turkey, China, India, um, Indonesia, you know, and many other places. But the production of these, these raw materials, the textiles, and then the actual designing and giving the imprimatur to the industry is still very much, a, at least in large scale, um, an Italian, French, and European um, you know, exercise. Then you have um, you know, what I call the, the fast fashion, and I'm not, I'm not calling it, you know, it's, this is the, the typical name, you know, the Zara's, the H&M, uh, the, the Cotton On, and so on. And these industries that tend to be also very much, um, you know, perhaps on the other side of the Atlantic, not all, but, you know, considerable amount, um, they tend to copy uh, the, the creation done by the, the Europeans. And, you know, I would put, you know, Ralph Lauren in that mix, you know, is a higher level, but, you know, certainly uh, has made a lot of his, you know, a lot of his fashion copying from Armani, copying from Gucci and so on. And then um, it's an industry that has different needs uh, than the designers, the creators. And so when we think about fashion, the first thing is, what is fashion? It's fashion, um, you know, the Gucci or is fashion the Forever 21? And I think they're both fashion. Um, fashion is very much related to identity. Fashion goes into... Uh, mix and matching accessories, um, you know, when we hear about, you know, uh, um, you know, the Duchess of Cambridge, sometimes she wears Zara, sometimes she wear, you know, uh, much, much more expensive or designer clothing, but, you know, she's very fashionable no matter what. And so why do I say all that is because we don't have an alignment of interest industry-wise across the world. And because we don't have that, at least across the developed country that have been running the show of intellectual property norm setting for many, many, many decades. And because we don't, we see friction in the protection at intellectual property level. Early on in the Italian tradition, I, I'm Italian, and so you know I know that very well. Um, the Italian developed the idea of ornamental models. These are not 
petty patents in the, you know, in the denigratory way. The ornamental models are a way to protect through a quasi-patent system uh, for a shorter period of time uh, um, creations that are new and original. And these ornamental models is really what later at the European level became the industrial design. Uh, now Europe has both an harmonized national um, uh, system in which because of the European directive on design, every country has to have the same law. But Europe also has a supranational uh, industrial design uh, regulation that um, creates a unitary right across the 27 countries of Europe. And so clearly Europe, and this design um, fits multiple interests. It fits the interest of the purse and fashion makers in Italy and France, if it's the interest of the automotive industries in Germany, if it's the interest of the furniture maker in Scandinavia. And so these you see, it's, it's another instrument that is flexible enough. So fashion, it's a type of creativity that fit within certain categories of IP trademarks to identify the name and also the distinctive part of an item, copyright, uh, because we know now, unless we are in certain jurisdiction, I would say India probably still has the, 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 the imperial um, copyright system of the, the, the United Kingdom in which when there is three-dimensional um, uh, reproduction of, uh, um, you know, of, of some copyrighted, um, so is, to avoid the overlap between industrial design and copyright, um, you know, that's the case in Singapore, is the case in Hong Kong, is the case in New Zealand, in Australia, um, about 50 copies, you know, that article cannot have copyright enforcement. But in Europe, that's not the case. So you can have a full overlap between trademarks and copyright. In the United States, the United States, because again, promotes a more copying type of industry for decades, the United States has resisted the adoption of a fashion statue on a fashion, uh, specifically fashion law protection. Um, the latest attempt to create um, a fashion design right was done um, 10 years ago, um, almost 10 years ago um, in New York. And even that was not successful. But the result of that has been the Star Atletica case that I'm sure many of you have studied. And so in Star Atletica, the Supreme Court of the United States says, well, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's a uniform cheerleader uniform or another article, as long as it's not a useful article, you can paint, you can, you know, use stripes, you can use design, and that's protected. And, and so now in the United States, we have full trademark protection for, the, for fashion, Full copyright protection, of course, you know, they are, they are. Um, and, and so, you know, we end up with a much stronger monopoly than if we would just have industrial design. So how that India, uh, Indonesia, and, and many countries like that fit in? Well, you know, India is an incredible fashion, um, you know, between the sarari, the textiles, uh, and, and, and a lot of fusion that brings the old and the new. Um, and, and of course, India also strongly protects fashion with geographical indications, you know, through the Vanarazi, Silk, and, and, and others. And that's something that in Europe is not done yet. Uh, in Europe, uh, we are adopting a regulation on non-agricultural geographical indication that should pass, but has been in the pipeline for quite a while. And so, you know, the, 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 the thing that I think any fashion law practitioner should take out, when you practice IP, you are really an IP lawyer, you're not a fashion lawyer. You are an IP lawyer that work in the fashion industry, but still use the IP system. Um, the IP system for the protection of fashion changes um, more than in other fields based on the country where we are. Um, some country, you know, of course, you know, trademark protection, we can protect it everywhere. Uh, but you know, it's also important to understand the culture behind because not all judges or not all courts will be as fashion friendly. Uh, depending on the jurisdiction, and it might be more, more stricter in deciding, even though these tend to be very technical cases. And so, you know, be very sensitive to the national variation on law and interpretation. 
Um, and then understand clearly the differences between copyright enforceability across jurisdiction, because this does remain different. And understand when you should use design pattern versus industrial design protection. So this idea of accumulation, and if you are defending or working for Forever 21s or Zara, understand where are the exceptional limitation and what's possible to copy or not. I don't like these businesses because of all the uh, bad impact on sustainability, pollution, and so on. But on the other side, you know, they exist and they have lawyers and they have employees. And so, you know, people who serve this business should do what's the right thing for that business. And so it's really important to understand, again, the, the exception and limitation within it. And so, you know, this is a fascinating area in an area in which there are jobs and the fashion industry employs lots and lots of people in all the various segments of it. It's an industry that is extremely varied. Um, again, it goes from uh, the top luxury of Richemont, uh, Hermès, uh, all the way down to a much uh, more casual. Um, sometimes it's a mass industry. Think about the jeans, think about the t-shirt. Sometimes it's a more um, exclusive niche and scarcity driven industry. Um, and, and, you know, it's also an industry in which there is a lot of tradition, traditional cultural expression. Again, India is a wonderful example. I work a lot with the batik producer in Indonesia, also another very interesting example. So I think, um, you know, for anybody who wants to practice, this is a really interesting area to be and one that will continue to grow and have more work. So I, I hope more people will work in fashion because it's, a, it's really an interesting area. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Irene, uh, for uh, bringing out and highlighting the interface uh, between uh, copyright and design law, especially when we're talking about the fashion industry and uh, the fact that how the culture of a particular country or a state like, you know, that decides or that uh, like, you know, plays a very important role when we are talking about uh, the kind of uh, the uh, fashion that uh, like, you know, the fashion regime a particular country is following. Uh, so with this, I would just uh, now want uh, Miss uh, Namrata to actually uh, discuss about uh, like, you know, her uh, take upon how uh, IP and uh, the fashion industry, they uh, like, you know, they are related to each other. And what are those important uh, facts that we as IP professionals must uh, like, you know, keep in mind while we are uh, talking about the aspects of IP in the fashion industry. So over to you, uh, Ms. Namrita. Thank you so much, Gunjan. Uh, thank you first for inviting me and having me on this panel. It's, it's an absolute honor. Uh, thank you, Irene. I hope I'm pronouncing that right for that wonderful insight uh, for the international aspect that we just got and how um, similar and dissimilar it is with the Indian uh, landscape that uh, I'm just about to uh, sort of slightly delve into. Uh, just for reference, I've, uh, I want a PPT on screen so that people just have something to refer to. Uh, yeah, sure. You can just uh, share the screen because you're the, uh, like, you know, you're the host, yeah. you're the host. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. So, um, one of my favorite things to work in fashion law. Uh, why is that? Because um, my uh, career aspect has just been so that uh, I started with IP in a law firm, then went on to do IP with the high court lawyer and uh, did all aspects of prosecution, transaction, litigation, and uh, all sort of dispute resolution. Um, then when I actually started my own practice, uh, it was uh, quite obvious that uh, I would pursue something which I'm uh, mostly in love with. And also, to be honest, uh, me as a person, um, I cannot work or even read anything which I'm not interested in. So if, if uh, only if I like something, uh, if I want to know something more about it, I would uh, dive in the deep end. Otherwise, it's just uh, not, not my cup of tea. Um, so quickly, let's get on to it. Yeah, so um, 
An example that I keep uh, giving is that if uh, you're an artist and you are, say, um, thinking about um, a design in your head, everything, all legal aspects from when you're thinking about it to when you sketch it on a piece of paper, uh, you give it to your curriculum to make it, he gets you a first copy of it. Uh, that goes on to the wholesaler, then the retailer, then the end consumer. There, if there is any issue with, with the end consumer, the, the supply chain comes into the picture. And of course, there are other issues. Um, all legal aspects in that particular chain uh, fall into the umbrella that, that we, we are talking about today, which is fashion law. Um, we, when I was a student uh, about 10 years ago, um, I had never heard of anything called fashion law. It was just IP. Um, and today we'll discuss how uh, in just 10 years or seven or eight years even, how India has grown to accept, to encourage, to acknowledge the, the bandwidth that IP actually has. Um, like you can see, India actually has lots of organizations like the FFI, FBCI, APEC, which actually encourage, give legal support, give all creative support that uh, artists actually need in the country. Now, uh, the single most important way and a creative can actually protect their creation is intellectual property. Um, there are thankfully uh, proper acts that, that we can refer to, uh, namely trademark, copyright, design, patent, uh, GI even. Um, and there are still, there is still room for uh, amendments. There is still room for changes, but um, you know, I keep telling my clients that even if you follow or even if you um, follow the procedure of filing, say, your basic trademarks, basic copyrights, basic designs, uh, you'll, you'll do well for yourself. It's not that don't think about what's not there, but just accept what is already there and then make the most of it. Um, like we mentioned, a couple of uh, renowned examples. Um, something about trademark that we must remember is that um, also what I suggest to my clients is th that, a, that a logo or a trademark must be filed individually, all aspects must be filed individually, and then as a whole also, so as to have um, protection in each particular aspect of the mark. Also in India, especially uh, filing in black and white over filing in color gives you protection in all colors. If, of course, unless of course you're very particular that you must file in a particular color, then Pantone shades come into the picture. Copyright, like Irene also mentioned, is about original literary dramatic music work. Uh, the key word being original. Um, now we'll, we'll understand how copyright and design have a thin line when it comes to the fashion world, like she also mentioned that um, how do we distinguish should, uh, should one artist file copyrights or should one file design? It depends on what you want to do with your creative work. If you are in, um, in you want to expand your market line, if you want to have, of course, more than 50 um, manufactured aspects of that particular garment or that particular artistic work, then you file it in designs, otherwise copyright should work for you. Patents, uh, most technical uh, and most fun, to be honest, when it comes to the fashion world. Uh, but one thing that we, um, as an Indian clientele that I come with, is that we forget that we must reevaluate our patent every few years. It's not that, you know, okay, today I've formulated a particular technology and I'll file a patent and I'll forget about it. Um, you must, I, I'm sure everybody knows how tech evolves every single day. And likewise, your patent will also involve. And for the same reason, you must file, refile, or um, it's better to just file a fresh one again and again. And which is why uh, organizations, fashion houses, designers have multiple 
patterns which they file or on an everyday basis. Few examples of uh, patterns in fashion, uh, something that we all have used like is Velcro, zippers, um, lingerie actually plays a huge, huge part in fashion, stonewashed jeans. Uh, nowadays there's, there are new um, uh, fabrics which are odor repellent and so on. So a few designs. Uh, now design is any 3D ornamental um, part of the particular creation. Um, some of the iconic ones that there are, and of course there are many uh, others. When it comes to GI, uh, I want to talk about not what is GI because that, that's what we're all aware of, but how local artisans, uh, because we're talking about fashion, how local artisans are actually benefited from GI. And in fact, uh, GI in this particular country is doing um, a lot to encourage local artisans, a lot to, for them to get their actual due at the end of the day. Um, there, are, there are two ways that they go about it. First is, of course, that um, the design house, say, say a design house employs local artisans, um, they, of course, have, have a contract and ethically and legally, they're, they're supposed to pay a, a particular amount uh, to the local artisans whenever the sale occurs. Second, of course, is through GI tags and GI panchayats that they must uh, be a part of so that they can get that due. Couple of um, examples. Okay, something that um, is a huge part of fashion law, apart from IP, which is contracts. Uh, on a practical and everyday basis, when say two artists are collaborating, two design houses are collaborating, um, even for the simplest of things, uh, contract drafting and vetting is such a such an important role. Um, and I must encourage everybody to understand the clauses required in a particular uh, contract. Uh, these are the various kinds of contracts that you may find when it comes to the fashion houses. But of course, apart from that, there are so many more. There are license contracts, there are um, tech contracts uh, and so much more. But uh, how to protect your client in those three or four lines of a particular contract is where um, a lawyer's actual uh, legalese comes into picture and how they will uh, benefit their client can, can either be um, the artist or the, or the company or so on, doesn't matter. But uh, contract drafting vetting is an extremely essential part of fashion law. Okay, so before I actually talk about um, the consumer online ethics, I would like to also talk about how, um, in fact, something that we've just done uh, and we've uh, done over the years, uh, but since we did done yesterday, it's fresh in my mind, uh, take down applications. So um, like I think Gunjan mentioned that India is uh, infamous about having, um, you know, first copies and so on so on like you know there are multiple copies that are made of a particular design uh, of course social media is uh, such a boon and such uh, uh, such a place where a particular page um, can crop up every single day even though you've done something about it um, similarly uh, in such uh, such circumstances I have to be uh, I have to say and I'm very happy about it that um, intermediaries or social media uh, giants like say Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, even Google and Amazon uh, as of now have such, um, they have very, very active IP takedown policies. So tomorrow, if uh, your client comes and tells you that, you know, this particular page is copying my design or copying my trademark, what am I supposed to do? You can just simply file a, a trademark takedown policy on that particular website, give you your information, given your um, proof and uh, obviously state how, how the, the party is actually infringing. And 
uh, in a matter of hours, I would say that it's it's actually done. And it's pretty amazing how active they are. And I'm very happy about it because it solves uh, so much heartache for, for the artists who are, who've put in so much effort uh, into their designs. Um, but yeah, coming to uh, something that uh, you can do as say, you must remember is uh, something that you would put on your website, which is your terms and conditions, privacy policy statements, something these are uh, the uh, something which nobody ever reads, unfortunately, but one must because only then will you understand how important they are. And then, uh, you know, it, it saves uh, the company or the artist or even the consumer a lot of uh, time and effort and uh, in the quarrel, actually, you know, who's who is to blame and who is not to blame. So next time, please read the, the fine print that comes along with uh, anything that you sign. Okay, so um, now coming to uh, crimes and redresses. Um, some, some of the IP uh, allows you to have civil remedies. Some of, some of them allow you to have criminal remedies as well. Um, of course, with civil, with civil remedies, you get an injunction, you get damages, uh, you can ask them to um, completely burn out or exhaust their particular uh, infringed goods that they are or take it uh, to your side, however you want to do it. Um, the most common way to go about this is uh, say if, if, it's, if it's a registry action till then, you can file uh, an application of the registry itself or the tribunal stating that this particular person is um, infringing your mark and so on. Uh, the most common and most efficient even I've seen is a legal notice because uh, thankfully people still take legal notices seriously. And when you do send a legal notice and a lawyer sends a legal notice, it, it does, uh, does make an effort. And uh, of course, apart from that, there is arbitration, there is out of court dispute resolution techniques. Um, in fact, in litigation and especially in patent litigation, I've noticed um, when there are two big uh, corporations in, in picture, they choose or they, they want to solve the dispute out of court and not, of course, have their patent uh, thrashed over in, in, in open court. Um, there are so many uh, disputes that we've handled which are solved out of court, which uh, there is a settlement uh, of some sort which, which go on to multiple, uh, many, many crores. Uh, and of course, at the end of the day, if nothing works, there is litigation uh, which you can delve into and uh, hopefully uh, one wouldn't have to go that way. But if one does, then... Um, it's, it's very effective, uh, to say the least. Um, some of the case laws that I think which are relevant right now and have been as well, uh, one thing which I haven't mentioned here, which is with Ritika versus Biba, which was the one which actually decided how copyright and design, uh, where is the amalgamation, where the distinctive line, and so on. So yes, thank. Uh, that's probably the end of, I have to try to cram everything in, in like 10 minutes so that we can have uh, more time for questions. So I'll leave this here. I'll stop my screen share. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we will discuss everything else in the questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Namrata. Thank you for bringing in that different uh, perspective uh, to fashion and IP because I think most of us have been only concentrating upon the copyright and the design aspect, but we haven't actually gone into looking into looking it from the perspectives of patent and uh, GI also like if we talk about the local artisans and how uh, contract drafting and uh, the uh, provisions under privacy law and uh, like you know all the online uh, display that as artists and as uh, fashion influencers also, I think there are a lot of fashion influencers these days. So I think these are points that uh, like, you know, that, that would help them and uh, give them a guidance as to how they could at the very initial stage, uh, like, you know, ensure that some of their work or some of their ideas uh, are uh, like, you know, protected and they wouldn't have to go for uh, the dispute resolution.
but uh, i mean i mean beautifully you've uh, like you know put across in in these 10 minutes you've just beautifully put thank across thank you my pleasure entire uh, like you know concept thank you so much uh, i would now uh, request uh, miss uh, shreya uh, to also uh, like you know take the floor and uh, discuss uh, with us uh, her uh, take on uh, ip and fashion and how Uh, she has been looking at uh, the various aspects of uh, fashion law when we talk about its uh, interface in IP. Uh, yeah. uh, sure, thanks, Gunjan. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, after Irene and Namrata, I think most they've covered mostly everything that's there uh, that could have been in the last twenty minutes. Uh, what I am essentially going to do uh, for the next. Seven to eight minutes is going to be mostly brushing across what they've already done, and sort of giving like uh, an idea of practicality of what we generally come across when it comes to fashion industry. Uh, for the last five six years, I've been working with a lot of government organizations when it comes to uh, textile, fabric, artisans, and uh, specifically people in the uh, traditional knowledge background when it comes to uh, handicrafts and handlooms. So uh, eventually, I mean, at the end of the session, probably whenever we have question answers, I would want to sort of delve into that if there are any questions. Uh, Ideally, intellectual property has uh, I played like a very important role when it comes to growth in the fashion industry. Uh, IP as such is embedded in the fashion industries, like Namrata very well covered uh, the different forms of laws that not just restricted to IP but data privacy and you know contracts and other forms of laws that are just not IP. Um, With the advancement of uh, communication technology, supply chain logistics, social media, culture, etc., there has been a very uh, overwhelming pressure on the intellectual property law, because uh, India, uh, like Namrata very well said, uh, in the last ten years, India has seen a boom in the fashion industry. India has seen a remarkable development in the acceptance of a legal nuance when it comes to fashion industry. uh there isn't any fashion law or a statute that is called fashion law but uh, there is an interplay of multiple uh, laws that covers you know the nuances in the industry uh why i say it's an overwhelming pressure is because this kind of gives us um, you know a, a segue to either create or to amend the existing statutes to ensure that all little uh, the dignities of the fashion industry is embedded in the current statute or perhaps coming up with something absolutely innovative um ip uh, like i said has trademarks copyrights designs uh, all of them have been very well dealt with uh, i would want to basically delve into something which is very radical say for example take runways okay uh, runways essentially have uh, these high end fashion products on the show uh, but they're not all accessible or sold in the public market as fast fast fashion why that is done is because uh, not everyone and anyone can afford all runway products but what they try to do through those runway is to create a consumer identification through which then they can launch their most consumer friendly products which are say t-shirts perfumes cosmetics so that's kind of creating an ideology or a concept in the head of buyers that uh, a brand like gucci could also be made affordable to a regular buyer so uh, with that we first come with the the very basic form of ip which is the trademarks uh trademarks again is a combination uh, could be you know the brand name the logo combination of colors uh india has very recently seen a very uh, headway judgment in the red sole lobodon case which is basically the most iconic color mark when it comes to fashion industry in india uh unfortunately because of the rise in the popularity of this online retail market and the need i dare to be uh in fashion and to be uh in trend that the generation today has we have kind of triggered the uh you know the counterfeit market as well which has been uh while it is made a lot of things pocket friendly 
but it is also triggered like a, a deathbed to all original artisans or original creators. Uh, the ease of purchase and the affordability that consumers have today has triggered the fakes market. Like I said, uh, one of the very important or the very, not important, but one of the very Im imaginary wrong is the piracy that we see. Fashion design piracy involves uh, unauthorized copying of original fashion designs, generally, which falls into two very important categories, which is knockoffs and counterfeits. Uh, very important when it comes to uh, trademarks law. Uh, knockoffs is uh, a close copy of the original fashion design, which basically mimics the elements of a product, uh, but is sold under a very different label. So the ideology of creating a knockoff is not to pass off your product as that of an original product, but to essentially be able to convey uh, that you own something which appears similar. Second is counterfeit, which is blatant copying, uh, where not just the design or the logo or the trademark is copied, it's basically uh, identical product just sold under the same brand name. Um, counterfeit is the most, I mean, is the worst of the two evils. Uh, counterfeits has uh, one more, uh, which is triggered the biggest Indian uh, market when it comes to Delhi, of most of you all already know, uh, which kind of gives leads to the concept of first copy, which is uh, nothing but an identical version of the original product, but, uh, you know, which compromises on quality and of course the brand identity. Uh, India has a big uh, knockoff counterfeit market uh, when it comes to fashion industry, which is uh, if, if I have a Dipika Padukone Sabhisachi, it is, it is not, uh, I mean, it, if it's from Delhi, it could might it might as well be from Chandi Chowk. So it's not even half the price. It's one tenth of the actual price. It's uh, almost the same amount of effort actually put in by the characters who create the design. But the only thing is they haven't had or they haven't used the intellect that was actually uh, used to create the original work. So that's... You know, in today's market, any kind of product is a victim or any kind of brand is a victim to counterfeits. Uh, one of the biggest uh, brands that has seen counterfeits and has also sort of utilized it or turned the tables uh, on counterfeits is Gucci. Uh, I think back in 2015, Gucci sort of was targeted by uh, a Gucci ghost, basically, which is basically an artist who was, a, you know, who was, and who was called the troubled uh, Andrew or Trevor Andrews. What he did was he went around the streets of, uh, you know, Paris and kind of wrote or scribbled on the walls of uh, the street, and he recreated or he copied the Gucci designs on the walls. So, you know, this kind of inspired Gucci to collaborate with this person uh, and come up with a, one of the leading Milan uh, 2015 runway range, which was called the, you know, I, I think it was called the fake spray painted uh, series, which basically had nothing but his spray painted designs on the products. So what Gucci very interestingly did was instead of going head on with this person, they kind of collaborated with him and turned the tables on counterfeits or turned the tables on someone who's infringing their rights. Uh, very recently, we saw the little Nas X uh, Satan shoe issue which was, uh, unfortunately, I, I am not sure how uh, true it is, but it did say that each shoe has, uh, you know, one drop of blood of uh, one of the mischief creative members. Uh, very spooky, but if true, actually, I mean, I don't know. It, it just, I mean, it might have been true though. Uh, what they did was they created a mischief range of uh, shoes. They used the Nike air bubble which kind of led to consumer confusion in the market that said that this may have been something was that was launched by Nike. Nike did not even wait for more than I think around. I think they wait for, waited for around three to four hours. They launched a complaint, they filed a lawsuit and it was decided in their favor. But um, I mean, within seconds, the shoe was out of stock. So, I mean, what was lost was lost. 
So that's how, uh, that's what I was trying to enunciate here was the fact that the fashion industry is so fast and it's so uh, quick developing that catching or nibbing some uh, wrong at the part is, it has kind of become very difficult. So instead of taking a defensive approach of trying to fight counterfeits, trying to fight infringement, our approach has to be more of an aggressive stand where we protect our IP rights or protect our creativity at the right time, knowing the right law through the right system. Uh, I think uh, Namrata, actually Namrata spoke about uh, the Biba and the Ritika case, which is the Ritika, uh, Ritu Wears versus Biba case, which is a very uh, interesting concept where there is where the thin line between uh, designs and copyright is brought in. Uh, copyright, again, is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very uh, interesting form of law because copyright does not have to necessarily be uh, registered through, you know, forms and applications. It could, I mean, it's said to be an inherent law where you just create and you are the owner. Uh, what happens in fashion industry is while this is interesting, you have inherent law, it's always important to be aware of your rights and file necessary documentation, or at least if not file copyright applications, create and keep your paper trails of your creation. That is because tomorrow if your uh, product, if your work is infringed, you at least have a chain of paper trails to know where and when you created your work. Uh, Copyright, unfortunately, in India has a, a downside when it comes to fashion industry is uh, industrial implementation of the work as such for more than 50 times. So if you create something which is in the public market and you have sold more than 50 pieces of it, you by natural law, you lose the copyright in it. So while this is a downside, you have uh, another option here is, that is the design slow. Uh, very uh, honestly, copyright or designs is not uh, interchangeable. They are not to be used as an alternate to each other. They are to be, I mean, you being a designer have to explore what fits well to you, what actually integrates or what it actually goes with your business. Copyright. Um, if, if you are someone who's creating these custom-made limited edition products or, you know, one of, uh, you know, Kanojur series or something, you may want to stick to copyright because I'm sure those kind of limited edition products are not going to be more than 50 pieces. Copyright will be granted on your entire work, which is basically uh, not the product product, but the underlining artistic work of the product. So it's always good. So, for example, if you want to register, say, a print that you've created, say, for example, a flower that you've designed, which you want to put up, say, on a, on a kurta or a jeans, what you do is instead of registering your kurta or the jeans altogether, what you must do is try and protect the flower as such as an artistic work, just the drawing of the flower. Then that gives you enough uh, scope to print, reprint, or put it on any other material or any other product. Uh, if you lose copyright, if you think copyright is not something that is going to fit to your business uh, model and you are going to, of course, manufacture it more than 50 times, your other option is designs. Uh, not all is lost if you lose copyright, you still have designs. Uh, but again, designs uh, is becomes your first step because you, uh, the, you know, the requirement for design registration is that your design must not be in public domain. Even a single uh, Facebook announcement saying that, hey, I designed this and I'm going to come up with, say, a series of clothing with this design lets you lose your design rights because that's when you put it in public domain. So if you are creating something, know where you want to come, which law you want to protect your product under your design sander and only then go ahead with it. Do not put anything in public domain unless and until you're very sure that uh, you do not want rights on it. Uh, designs can not protect the entire garment if created. It generally protects the shape and the design and the color the patterns of the product. So your design rights have to be, or you know, your designs have to be in a way that you're able to holistically 
enter and maintain the rights that you've applied for. Uh, going back to the Ritukumar case, um, this was a very interesting situation where uh, a, a design of Ritukumar was copied by Biba, but uh, what unfortunately Ritukumar did was uh, when, when they brought Biba to court, they kind of took the defense of copyright saying it was my inherent design and I created it, uh, you know, X and Y. But then what Biba kind of did was they were able to prove that Ritu Kumar had already sold more than 50 pieces of that product. And that's how they lost copyright in it. And because it was already in public domain and Ritu Kumar never had or never took the decision of filing a design registration before bringing it to the public domain, they kind of had no other options. So Biba ran scot free. So that's ideally uh, what the interplay between designs and copyrights is. Uh, always good to be able to understand where and what you want to monopolize. Uh, IP law is ideally uh, created to give you know, rights and protection to creators, but it does not also uh, kind of keeps anyone at bay from creating something that could be remotely similar. Uh, coming to the last aspect of IP, which is uh, which I would want to deal with is geographical indication. Uh, geographical indication is not an independent right. It's not held by one single person. Uh, it is held by a community. Uh, mostly in India, uh, the, the known geographical indications are the Kanjivar of Sil, the Kanjivarams and the Banarsis. They are uh, given the rights to geographical indication because they come from a certain geography and uh, are sort of, you know, given segue or given importance to through these forms uh, of protection. Uh, for artisans or for weavers or for people in the fashion industry, it is important to be able to source your fabric, your textile, your products, or your design from the right artisan. So uh, like Namrata said, know where you want to source your products from. You take it from the panchayats or you take it from the artisan's community, but ensure that you are actually picking up something which is GI tag and not something which is uh, sold in the open market so that at least the artisans who must receive their dues are actually being given so. So, I mean, that that's it from my end. I think uh, everyone else covered everything. So we could, um, if it's open for questions, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miss uh, Shreya, for having uh, brought in uh, the aspects pertaining to the problems, uh, like, you know, that are there uh, with regard to uh, the protection of uh, any form of uh, fashion as far as IP is concerned, because none of uh, the protection regimes uh, seem to be uh, very promising when it comes to uh, the fashion industry and the stakeholders who are there in uh, the fashion industry. And also keeping in mind the fact that, uh, like, you know, it is something that changes every day. So uh, bringing in, uh, like, you know, one uh, uh, protection regime also may not, uh, like, you know, help us. Uh, so thank you so much to all the three uh, speakers uh, for the session. I think now it's time for us to uh, come to the last segment of the session, which is the Q&A session. Uh, so the very first question that I have uh, is for Miss, uh, is for Professor uh, Calvary. Uh, so uh, the question is, ma'am, uh, uh, what is your, uh, like, you know, personal advice uh, to fashion designers today? Uh, with regard to their approach as far as the protection uh, of their designs in fashion apparels or any other fashion product is concerned? So uh, thank you very much. Um, what I, I you know, I, I actually, I teach fashion designers um, in a variety of classes. And what I try to tell them, they need to be aware of the ecosystem. They need to be aware of what, could be protected, how they're, you know, from the materials they use, the technology of these materials, who created these materials, them, how they use perhaps in an original way, um, then the shape of the products, the color of the product. So I would try to make them understand 
all the various pieces of the products from the, the, the drawing to the sourcing to the making to the selling, the distribution and the sales strategy. And once they understand all that, then it comes down to budget and time. Mm -hmm. You no company, not even you know the the, the Richemont or the, the LVMH has you know infinite resources. You need to make choices that are business choices of what law to use where. Mm -hmm. There is no point to go and try to register a patent in several countries in which there is not much enforcement. While the, it makes much more sense to do have copyright, for example, because copyright, you don't have to go and register everywhere. You can rely on copyright, you know, based on the point of attachment to burn convention. If, you know, it's a known three-dimensional, three-dimensional in a jurisdiction that, 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 that doesn't have that, you know, the incompatibility between design and, and copyright. But the main advice is you need to understand the ecosystem. Then you need to understand what your budget and your strategy is. There are some mistakes that should be avoided by all costs, such as disclosing novelty or not having you know, good non-disclosure agreements when you deal with, with, with distributors or with, with contractors. Because if you want to have a design, an industrial design, unless you're in Europe, and now I believe Israel as well, where you also have a bit of non-registered uh, uh, design protection in Europe for a year, up to three years. You know, within the first year, you can still, um, you know, then then transition to a registered design. But if you don't have novelty, um, you can't have industrial design protection. And at least, uh, you know, industrial design protection is not very expensive and examination intensive as a patent it, it could be. And so it's really important for designers to have the design protection. To me, that's probably the most important right at the beginning, in addition to the trademark. Um, and it's the easier to enforce because in design, you don't have to prove likelihood of confusion. And you know, a tiny small tweak in uh, you know can really make you know likelihood of confusion, there is no confusion. And so you can really can't have trademark infringement to prove dilution is really difficult. And so the fact that you have a design protection, registered design that covers also substantially similar, um, it's, it's important. So some of, so the most important thing industrial fashion designer have to understand is how you, so the ecosystem, strategic decision, budget, and then careful about non-disclosing. I know they are very careful. In fact, you know, they have to protect, they, they really are careful about espionage and, and there is a lot of espionage, unfortunately, in this, play, you know, in this, in this field. Also because, you know, as my, my co-panelist said, this is a very fast pace. Even for, you know, the top luxury brand, it's fast pace. And this is why there is such an incorporation now of these monograms is because this remains a distinctive element that carries on throughout different collections. Otherwise, you know, by the time you have been able to enforce your right, you know, the season is gone. It's gone three months ago or five months ago. There is nothing. You just it's a it's a, it's a place where you take a shot. And so it's the more you prevent, the more technical barriers using you know, of course, you know the 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 passwords, uh, watermarks, and blockchain. Blockchain is becoming really a good way to certify things um, without, so you can prove priorities, for example. Um, but you know, the, the thing is, you have to make strategic decision, but some mistakes in terms of disclosing and not pay attention to your novelty might really be um, the biggest problem in, in the development of the fashion industry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Calbly, for bringing out uh, the uh, aspect of uh, understanding novelty part in uh, the design or the fashion aspect that we've created and accordingly go for uh, the protection. 
so the next question that i have is for miss namruta um you know you've been dealing with uh, like you know sort of uh, cases where there is actual dispute and actual confrontation as far as protection of uh, the design of the uh, like you know fashion designers are concerned so and in india we've seen that there are a lot of labels so what they do is they try to protect their labels by way of trademarks okay instead of getting any uh, protection per se under any copyright regime or uh, the design regime and we've also seen that both copyright and the design interface that is there that is also creating a lot of problem as far as the fashion designers are concerned so what according to you can be a like you know um, uh, i mean the legit uh, way of uh, protecting the um, uh, fashion industries um, like you know under ip Uh, and also with this, uh, the very first question is that: Do we actually think of uh, giving them any protection, or uh, like you know, per se, the kind of open system that they have is that something like you know, which is uh, fine, and therefore we really do not need any sort of protection as far as uh, the fashion labels or the fashion designers are concerned. Very interesting question. Um, also. something that uh, we lawyers uh, of uh, which have had the privilege of working with artists uh, design houses or even in ip um first part of the question is there a need uh, for an actual uh, filing yes more than anything else uh, thankfully um, i am seeing that the awareness is enough should be a lot more um once artists entrepreneurs organizations are aware uh, as to where you need to file because that's that's the first confusion okay i have i have a label i have designs i have my trademark now where am i supposed to file these things there are so many acts so many filings that's where a lawyer comes to the picture who will guide you as to what falls in the trademark domain what falls in the copyright and so on so on uh once you figure that out um like we've discussed all three of us actually how uh, how there's a thin line between copyright and design and how uh, shreya also um, elaborated about uh, the ritika versus biva case where you as a design house or you as uh, as a creative first must understand what you need out of the creation that you're doing if you're doing uh, something which is which is to be short lived which you don't require mass production of then you can very well go file a copyright but if you do require say any fast fashion brand any in, in, in fact now there's all everybody wants to make money out of their uh, their design so why not so they'll manufacture 50 or more and then you must file it on the design that's probably the single most important thing that you must remember and it's quite simple like that because uh, once you understood that then it's very easy to understand should i file a copyright should i file a design and i see uh, quite a few questions here which actually uh, are about this particular matter itself uh, so this is something that it's very simple you must just remember that if you want a small collection uh, capsule collection or whatever you want to call it which uh, for which you're not going to manufacture 50 or more then you file it in copyright otherwise you have a design protection um so yeah but apart from that uh, filing is most necessary uh, like i mentioned especially when it comes to patents you must refile you must reevaluate um i understand when it comes to you know a lot of artists come and tell me that you know we have so many designs we have so many a uh, thing that how can you how can we file everything it's you know it's just not practical and i i get it uh, it's not um practical uh economically as well and of course the amount of paperwork and the amount of um hassle that artists especially artists are usually non uh, document friendly uh, they don't want anything to do with documents so uh, they feel that it's too much and i get it um so like shreya also mentioned that um say you are um creating like like uh, brands like good earth nikobar what do they do uh they have motifs um which they create which of course if everything honestly in my opinion everything is inspired by everybody right and especially in these kind of brands uh everything is inspired from our heritage from the natural sources that we have 
so uh, if you are the first person to actually be inspired correctly and uh, create something of originality and then protect it it's yours it doesn't matter if uh, you know it's it's been there for 1000 years or not um right so uh, pick and choose something which you need to protect uh you don't need to protect every single ornamentation you don't need to protect every single motif that you're creating or applying to a garment pick and choose something which you're going to say produce um multiple times have multiple uh um say international international exposure as well so those things that you must uh, protect and um the but essentially you must understand that if you don't then tomorrow it will get copied and then uh, you cannot go and say that oh i had but i had created it you know copyright uh, is not mandatory to file a copyright but yes but people uh, fail to understand that if you want to um, restrict somebody from uh, infringing you must have an application filed so that's the basic of it and uh, yeah i think uh, that answers the question uh thank you thank you so much uh, namrata uh, next i think uh, the question niharika has uh, put it in the chat box i think uh, miss uh, shreya can give an answer to it so the question is that do you think that we need more evidence based uh, findings for policy making purposes uh, so i think uh, this is related also to uh, a follow up of what uh, namrata has also pointed out with respect to pick and choose the kind of the actual a uh, protection regime that you want to uh, so do you think that uh, like you know as far as india is concerned because we don't have any clarity uh, for uh, the fashion designers so can there be a sui generis uh, system where it's an open system and there is a freedom given to the designers and also does this uh, like you know require a more evidence based uh, finding uh, for the purpose of uh, bringing out a legislation of that sort see uh, this is again very subjective uh, to what who who's looking at it i mean if it's a designer i think they would want to have a sui generis uh, platform if it's if it's the represented uh, attorneys or the advocates they would preferably want that to be on a statute paper bound and you know with acts and sections uh but i mean my personal view uh, is that uh, this this has to be in harmonious construction sort of by both uh, it has to be embedded and interplay because uh, the fact that i mean nahar pas correct when it comes to creating a policy which is more evidence based or creating a policy that is triggered by more uh, more evidence based unfortunately uh, the trademark i mean the ip system in india relieves or uh, thrives a lot on uh, the quantum of distinctiveness which is something that can only be established by a plethora of evidence uh, being unique being uh, original being novel uh, being the first adopter first creator is all that can only be established through documentation through paper trails and evidence so that is something that is very elementary for everyone who is in the space to be aware and to be mindful of every single pencil sketch that they put on paper uh, what is essentially important uh, for policy creation and development is we may uh, we may not be there yet to develop a fashion act per se but we always have the space to kind of uh, amend the existing ip regime uh, very interesting uh, recent so trademark office has recently come up with so um, has asked for requests for amendment to the trademark act after the amendment of the trademark rules they have called for uh, our inputs and one of the very leading input that i see uh, in the trademark definition is uh, the fact that they want to do away with the uh, you know with the definition do away with the word or uh, graphical representation uh because that's kind of uh, has limited scope of ip protection uh for example i mean i i may not be able to graphically represent a certain design when it comes to a motif i may want to say that something is inspired out of a sun or a moon or whatever 
but uh, not everything may necessarily fall into the exact definition of what trademarks is today. So the fact that the IP regime in India is open to amendments and they are coming up with different strategies and calling in uh, inputs from stakeholders is, is a good headway to uh, the kind of change that we are willing to see. And uh, the definition of market in India is also kind of evolving. It is not restricting ourselves to the Indian market when it comes to uh, products that come across the borders. So they're kind of evolving and taking in, I mean, encompassing every aspect that could be more crucial and beneficial to the fashion industry. But that's again, something that we have to wait and see when, when it comes, when it occurs. And that's... Yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Shreya. And uh, if, if uh, I don't see that there are any more uh, questions, and I think the questions that uh, like, you know, are already there, we will also like, you know, uh, spoken about it. Uh, so um, thank you so much, uh, all the three uh, panel members uh, for being here uh, with us today and speaking on uh, such an important um, uh, aspect that is mostly not uh, like you know that is mostly not um, uh, referred to by uh, most of the people who are there because we're only concerned about patents and about the general copyright and trademarks but yes i think when talking about the fashion industry um, it is time to actually think of if we could have uh, like you know some form of protection and if we have it then what should it be and how uh, a fashion designer also must uh, make a decision uh, with regard to the, uh, like, you know, the, the perfect uh, type of protection that, uh, like, you know, would help them go further. Uh, and with this, we also have another theory which says that because fashion is changing, so there is no point in uh, protecting it. Uh, so uh, keeping all of this in mind and, uh, like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Thinking, going ahead with all of uh, the discussions that we've had today. I think uh, now it's time uh, for all of us uh, to uh, like, you know, end, uh, end the session here. So I would want uh, Amishi, uh, who's the student uh, chairperson uh, for the Center for IPR at Institute of Law Nirma University, uh, to please give away a vote of thanks to all our uh, like, you know, speakers for the day and also our participants for being here with us for the session. Over to you, Amishi. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Center for Intellectual Property Rights at Institute of Law, Nirma University, I would like to extend my sincere and heartiest gratitude to our esteemed speakers today, Ms. Irene Kalboli, Ms. Namrata Pawa, and Ms. Shreya Ganguly, for taking out the time from their busy schedule to address the session today and provide their valuable insights on such a prominent topic. This has surely been a very informative and also an enriching session. I also extend my sincere gratitude to our director and dean, Professor Dr. Madhuri Parikh, for her constant support to the centers to organize such events that help in stimulating and promoting knowledge. My earnest thanks to assistant professor and center head, Ms. Kunjan Arora, for moderating the session in such a seamless manner. I also thank Ms. Taruna Jakhar, Associate Head for her guidance and support in organizing the webinar. This event would not have been conducted smoothly without the technical assistance and support of Mr. Gagandeep uh, Singh Dhanbuja and assistant, uh, at the Assistant Registrar at ILNU and Mr. Digant Rathod and the center team. Lastly, I would like to thank all participants for joining in and for their patient and active listening. Thank you all and have a great day ahead today. Thank you, so you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank nice you for day. everything. <laughs> it was very good. It was actually very, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shreya. Thank you, Ms. Thank Samsung. you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.